Oh my goodness. How do I find it? How do I find the song? Wonderful words. Wonderful words. Okay. Two eight six. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Our first song today will be hymn number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. Our next hymn will be Joyful, Joyful, hymn number 12. Thank you. 
Please stand for our opening song in Christ alone. Okay, we're actually going to do My Maker and My King, hymn number 15. So let me continue. Thank you, AJ. morning and happy Sabbath church. Let us place ourselves in the presence of God as we seek him in prayer. For those who are able, you can kneel down and for those who are not, you can remain seated. Let us pray. Our, our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, creator and sustainer of the of life, provider of every perfect gift in whom there is no variables, neither shadow of turning. We humbly come before you in your holy presence this beautiful Sabbath morning to honor and to praise you and give glory to your name. We want to confess to you our sins and weaknesses that broke our intimate relationship with you. Forgive us, Father, for neglecting to commune with you more often for trying to do every single task in your own way without your guidance, for being reborn in your articulate children. Please wash our sins away, for aping us a clean heart, 
see you. I write I write for it to the rest. So that all my students can show the for forgiveness. May you bless all the participants of this program as well as all the best present in the church. And may you feel the peace and <coughs> sacredness as we partake the Sabbath service. May we learn more from you as we study and hear your holy word and be able to reflect Christ's character as we fellowship with one another. May you fill us with your holy presence and your Holy Spirit that everything we will do would be for your glory and in harmony with your will. Thank you for hearing and accepting our prayers. All these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Happy Sabbath to everyone. How's your uh, day and your weekdays, past weekdays? Is it busy, stressful? Like uh, running chicken without head, they call it. We have a very interesting program right now. Uh, thank you for our praise team, Sister Arlene, Christine, and all the our uh, two brothers who come here. Uh, if you read, you have your program. You can read our, you know, our program this Sabbath school. And I'd like to thank uh, Rachel too for giving us opening, the opening. Um, uh, prayer and our pianist AJ. Um, before um, Ed Atsubadi give us a special feature, uh, Brother AJ will uh, give a special music. But the thing is, it's in here. It's not uh, recorded. Uh, uh, the we call it the uh, uh, mission spotlight. I hope AJ will uh, play the after I talk uh, play the mission spotlight. And then we're gonna separate by class, and we could discuss our lesson. So let's uh, feel the presence of God with us, and happy Sabbath to all, especially our viewers. One Sabbath, 12-year-old Ariel heard a sermon that really made him think. The pastor had said that everyone should be involved in missionary work. Ariel liked the idea of being a missionary, but what could a 12-year-old boy in Bolivia do? Ariel began to pray and ask God to help him be a missionary. He began to look for people who might be interested in learning about Jesus. As he looked, he kept praying. He didn't have to look far. One day, he went with his parents and sister to visit another family. While there, he learned that the family was interested in the Bible. He offered to give them Bible studies, and they agreed. Ariel had never given Bible studies before, so he wasn't really sure what to do, but he found a set of Bible lessons and studied them with the family. It wasn't easy, especially the last few lessons, but he prayed for God to help him. Ariel wanted to give more Bible studies, so he invited his classmate, Hebert, to study the Bible with him. Hebert looked forward to each new lesson. When they finished studying, Hebert decided to give his life to Jesus and was baptized.
Ariel was so happy. God was helping him be a missionary. He remembered his original prayer to be a missionary and decided to continue praying to see what God wanted from him next. Ariel has found that he can be a missionary in many ways. He studies the Sabbath school lesson every day so he can learn more about God. Whenever he earns some money, he sets aside 10% to return to God as tithe, and he also gladly gives some of the money as an offering. In everything that Ariel does, he wants to put God first. Even though Ariel is only 12, he has already led others to Jesus. No one is ever too young to be a missionary, he says. We can all be missionaries, sharing our love for God as we wait for Him to take us to heaven. There is no Adventist church where Ariel lives. His family and others meet in one another's homes on Sabbath. It was in one of the church members' homes that Ariel heard the sermon that inspired him to become a missionary. Ariel's dream is for a church to open in his town one day. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a church near Ariel's town. Thank you for planning a generous offering so that more people can have a church where they can gather and share the good news that Jesus is coming soon. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, I don't know if this is for one month or this week. We're still continuing on our theme, which is health and wellness. So for this morning, the Sabbath, I chose the topic for the title, Health and Healing, the God's Way. God's Way of Healing to Restore Total Health. I cannot think of any other true healing 
except that of God, who is the greatest physician and healer who best knows human condition, not only physically or mentally, but also spiritually. He who created man and endowed him with life-giving force is the only one who can truly understand how this man would live and grow sound and healthy and even live longer. God has the best wish for each one of us. The Bible says in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. There are two kinds of health mentioned here. If you look at the original word for health, that refers to the physical health, the hugaino in Greek. And it says here, this, as your soul prospers. So God is also interested in a spiritual aspect. That is an interesting, interesting fact that God wants us also not only to be physically healthy, but also spiritually sound. Christ even showed us that we should possess balanced health. In uh, Luke 2, 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The World Health Organization agrees to this principle of a balanced well-being by defining health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The way God heals and treats human illnesses is very unique. His divine healing is real, instant, and complete. Man might be cured of his sickness through synthetic or natural means, but it is only God who can truly make us well and sound. It takes a touch of faith before we can experience true healing and health. It takes Jesus' powerful, powerful words and touch in order for us to recover from our worst health conditions. There was once a woman who had been sick for 12 years, who said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. So that's instant. And that is in Matthew 9, verses 21 to 22. Now in Matthew 9, 27 to 30, there is another story here. Two blind men followed and came to Jesus and begged for mercy. Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you and their eyes were open, instant. From the pen of inspiration, we are being reminded that God who created us is in control of our health and healing. According to Ellen White uh, on Councils on Health, page 168, through the agencies of nature, God is working day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, to keep us alive, to build up and restore us. When any part of the body sustains injury, a healing process is at once begun. Nature's agencies are set at work to restore soundness, but the power working through these agencies is the power of God. All life-giving power is from Him. When one recovers from disease, it is God who restores him. I always put this in my mind. Whatever I do, I follow health principles. I'm, I practice semi-vegetarianism. 
I, I practiced for one year, vegan. But all these things are nothing if God will not restore our health. And so let us put always in our minds that it is God who gives us or who heals us and gives us healing and health. Thank you.
Hello, happy Sabbath everybody. Are you happy today? It's Sabbath? Yeah, I'm very happy now that I am here again to worship with you brothers and sisters. Uh, please forgive me if I wear still the mask because uh, I'm immune, no compromise. But anyway, my wife has uh, already finished her uh, COVID, so it's okay now. I cannot transfer it to you, but you might transfer it to me. Anyway, uh, before I continue with the introduction, there is an announcement first. I will just call first uh, for the announcement of uh, activity tomorrow. Let's hear the announcement first. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, I just want to invite everyone again for our 
annual church picnic tomorrow. It's gonna be the first one since the pandemic. So I hope everyone can attend. It will be in Central Park in Burnaby from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., rain or shine. So unless it really rains a lot tomorrow, then we will be at the basement last resort, but I think it'll be sunny. So we will see you there. And um, if there is anyone else who can help with um, the transport of some of our tables and barbecue grills, if you can coordinate with Kuya Bong Trinidad, it'll be great. And uh, we'll see you there. The closest entrance to our picnic site, it is picnic site number one. It is the first entrance right after the boundary and Kingsway intersection along Kingsway, just by the Swan Guard Stadium. So it'll be easy to find. We'll see you there. Thank you. The other announcement is uh, to be announced by Mimi. Good morning, Church. So this is the first reading of uh, the transfer of membership of Pastor Neil Batiansila from Edmonton Filipino SDA Church to Vancouver Filipino SDA Church. Thank you. So other announcement: picnic in the park, full evangelism of our own church, September twenty-four to October twenty-six, twenty twenty-two. Each one, invite one, one friend, one family, one acquaintance. Uh, tithes and offerings, we also encourage our members to give offerings to the local church budget. This way we can support any department that needs financial support. You can also give your tithes through online giving. Gym night, every Sunday at Deerish Lake School starting from 7 p.m. Charge choir practice this afternoon at around 1.30. I think it's, uh, yeah. If you want to join the choir, approach Roger Magsalin, Levi Bakabak, and Modesta Dagoyen. Elder Council's meeting is postponed and will be announced later. And uh, uh, Brother Amado uh, told me that uh, the activities for a dissemination of the event during men's camp meeting will be uh, discussed later due to schedule of uh, different parents this afternoon, right, Brother Amado? So it will be announced uh, later. And may I have the guest book if uh, we have the visitor? No guest book yet? No one is... Uh... But I have observed a visitor. Please, uh, visitor, please stand and uh, we will recognize you. <laughs> Sister Geraldine, Geraldine from... <laughs> ah, okay. Other, other. I, I have. Oh, yeah. Uh, sister from. Oh, Colorado. Thank you. Thank you for visiting us. Welcome to our Sabbath. Other? No more? Oh, we welcome you all, brothers and sisters, especially those who are uh, watching us online. Uh, we welcome you this uh, Sabbath and thank you for joining us and uh, having our Sabbath uh, today. Uh, our speaker for today is familiar to you already, but to me it's uh, my first time to hear him. Our pastor is also a Bible worker named Paco. No, no, it's Neil. 
my son is Neil also, and they call him Paco. That's why I... <laughs> Neil Basian Sila. Pastor Neil Basian Sila is our youth pastor and a Bible worker from Edmonton, Alberta. But he was born in Toronto, AJ. <laughs> he was born in Toronto. Uh, her mother uh, checked him and he said it's Toronto. No, it's Toronto. Uh, there's no more. He was, I think he graduated from our school in Burma. Is that right? Burman, Burman University. Uh, he will uh, give us a wonderful message entitled to charge the church that forget to love. Then uh, after me, the praise team will uh, come here with the uh, Bagano and Cobas family. Then congregation introit invocation by Pastor Neil, opening him or worship the king then worship through giving I'll be the one to read then I forgot to to call uh, the deacon last uh, last Sabbath but I think we have uh, a deacon ready so I will call them after uh, my operatory reading then worship through prayer him of prayer, him of preparation for prayer, then garden of prayer by Elder Dan Tingson, then worship through the word, children's story by Amanda Faith Kovas, then scripture reading again by Elder Dan Tingson, then special song, wow, I miss this, special song by the Banfield SDA Church Choir. I miss them. Then the message by Pastor Neil. Then closing, love at home. Then benediction by Pastor Neil. And hymn of hope. That will be our uh, divine worship program for today. And we'll, oh, I hear the name. I, I will repeat again the... Uh, although you see them already, Kovas family from... Miami, Sherio, Ferchi, Amanda, and Sivan. Then Divine Foster, Colorado. Um, Michaela Foster, Colorado also. Okay. Uh, thank you and happy Sabbath, everybody. Uh, can I call on the praise team? Are we on? All right, we're on. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. Our elder asked us if we are happy. And I can say for a fact that we're happy to be here in your beautiful, sunshiny British Columbia. It's our second Sabbath here, so we're not guests anymore, right? <laughs> We are family. Um, my name is Furchi, my husband Sergio, my daughter Amanda, Sivan, our youngest, and we have, of course, uh, Chriselle and Sam, my sister on the piano, Renz. and I mean, Renz. and Renz on the organ. Yes, yeah, so we're going to have a wonderful time praising the Lord together. I want to take this time to thank you all. Um, for welcoming my sister's family and my mother into this beautiful Vancouver Filipino community. Um, it has been 13 years since we were here, so my son celebrated his fourth birthday, I believe, here during that time. So he's now 16, going on 17. My daughter just turned 18, so it's been a long time. Um, I had 
met many of you, so it was nice seeing you again and meeting new faces. I am so impressed that you have such a wonderful youth and young adult group that is very active. It's so great to see that. So we're going to be leading out in praise and worship, but you, my dear friends and family, are the choir. So we're all going to be singing out loud for the audience of one today. We had... Can you hear me now? We had spent time this week visiting parks and open spaces in the area. God is love is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass. The lovely birds making their air vocal with their happy songs. The delicately tinted flowers and the lofty trees all testify to the care of the Father, fatherly care of our Heavenly Father. That is from Steps to Christ. In nature, test testify of him, so should his children. We invite you to join us singing our first song, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. Jesus described his earthly mission by saying, The Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, give sight to the blind, and set to liberty those who are bruised. Luke 4, 8. He is still at work today, loving, redeeming, healing. May we allow his saving grace to shine in us and through us every day. We invite you to stand with us as we sing, Shine, Jesus, Shine. You're the light of your love 
light to be cherished and obeyed, not to be despised and rejected. The light which he sends becomes darkness to those who disregard it. The character of Jesus is revealed the character of Jesus revealed in his life is the character of God. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Please lift your voices in praise to Jesus, name above all names.
kneel down for the intro. we thank you for bringing us here all together on this Sabbath day. May we recognize you in your presence this morning. Be with us in our worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hymn number 83 for our opening song.
Our operatory reading for today is World Budget. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is known throughout the world for its mission outreach. Your regular and systematic mission offerings are like a life-giving river with tributaries flowing around the world, carrying refreshing water to mission fields. Every time we give our mission offerings, we're adding water to a life-giving river that flows through open through open parts, lands, bringing life and hope. We're helping the church grow, not only locally, but also in areas that we may not have been heard of. We're assisting missionaries we may never meet and building schools and clinics that we prob probably will never visit. We are helping plant churches we may never worship in. And we're bringing life to the church mission by introducing Jesus' love to the hearts and minds of people all around the world. Did you know that even before COVID-19, the Adventist Church was experiencing a noticeable decline in mission offerings? Part of the reason is that we sometimes want to give to a specific project or put our offerings toward something special that steers our hearts. We see the results and we feel satisfied. Giving to the mission offering may not be as glamorous as giving to a specific, well-advertised project or program, but mission offerings help sustain all mission projects. Just as we do not know where, we, where every drop of water in the river goes, we can see the results, and they are beautiful. Psalm 104 says, he sent the springs into the valleys they flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them, the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. In Matthew 28, Jesus himself said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Please prayerfully ask the Holy Spirit to show you what more you can do to support and sustain our Lord's work until he comes. Can we call on the deacon, please? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful day of Sabbath. And uh, thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to give the tithes and offerings that we have. Please uh, guide us always and protect us so that we can give more on, your, on the tithes and offerings. And bless these tithes and offerings, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The Garden of Prayer will be rendered by Elder Dantinson. And I will let encourage you to come forward because of uh, still COVID-19 is still at large. My wife has encountered COVID last Saturday, so I will not encourage you to come forward. But uh, please uh, pray, prayerfully do your best in your place. I'll invite everyone to please uh, kneel down. Father, our Creator, we praise and honor your holy name on this blessed Sabbath morning. You are a great God and no other is like you. For you alone deserve our worship. Today, we submit to you all our nature. Please quicken our conscience with your holiness. Nourish our mind with your truth. Purify our imagination by your beauty and open our hearts with your love. We now surrender all our will to your purpose. This week, O oh Lord, we have committed sins and equities against you and our fellow humans in our thoughts, in our words, and also in our deeds. We humbly seek for your mercy and forgiveness. Please, Lord, cleanse us from all our unrighteousness and make us worthy to receive your blessings, and be called your sons and daughters. Thank you for the assurance of salvation through our Savior Jesus Christ who died on the Calvary. We are grateful and want to glorify your holy name for our brethren who celebrated their physical and spiritual birthdays and for those who celebrate their wedding anniversaries. We thank you for being with them in the past year, giving them great health and a supportive family. For the husband and wife, please continue to strengthen and renew their relationship in their married life. I pray for the brethren who came now this morning to worship you, especially for those who are experiencing trials in their life. Please hold their hands of faith. For those who have unspoken requests, you know the desires of the, and contents of their hearts, Lord. May your will be done for them. I, friend, I would like to pray also for our brethren who are sick today and those who are seriously ill. Please touch them with your healing hands. You are our great physician and nothing is impossible with you. Please use the medical professionals and also the medication they are taking for the recovery and healing. This morning, O oh Lord, as we listen to your servant today, your chosen messenger, Pastor Neil, please anoint his lips and hide him behind the cross of the Calvary. Grant us an open and receptive hearts as we hear your message today. Thank you, O oh Lord, for heeding and answering our prayers, for we ask all these things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen.
Now let us hear the children's story to be rendered by Amanda Faith Kovacs. <laughs> girls happy sabbath so i we have i'm thankful that you two are here today um and i will be telling the story to you and to the young at heart here today so um when i was walking through the park with my family this week we saw a few dragonflies and it reminded me of that one sabbath morning as we were pulling out of the driveway and on our neighbor's lawn, we saw a whole bunch of butterf uh, butterflies, dragonflies um, nestled on the grass, and they were resting there. And when we saw that, my mom started uh, rem reminiscing about her childhood in the Philippines and her memories with the dragonflies. And upon hearing that, I began to think, hmm, I wonder like, how, what cool things God did with dragonflies that we can learn about them. So I did research, thanks to Google, and I found some few facts that I want to share with you all today. So dragonflies lay their eggs in the water, and when the larvae hatch, they live underwater for up to two years. Actually, depending on the altitude and latitude, some species may stay in the larval state for up to, you want to guess? How many years? What do you think? Five years? You're close. It's six years. And they will molt up to 17 times as they grow and get ready to head to the surface and transform into the dragonflies we see flying around the air. Isn't that cool? So thinking about how long dragonflies stay in the larval state made me consider the topic of prayer. Sometimes when we pray to God, we expect an immediate answer. While we know that God always answers our prayers, there are seasons in which he seems silent and doesn't answer right away. When this happens, there is a very good reason to. He wants us to wait. It is important to remember that God doesn't, never forgets about you or your prayer requests. And while waiting can be hard sometimes, God wants us to learn to be patient. He asks of us to wait so we can learn from those experiences that we have. So just like how the dragonfly has to wait even up to six years to grow up, there are moments when God asks us to wait for long periods of time because ultimately he has a plan for us. And as I close, I want to share a verse with you all. It is found in Psalm 37, verse 7, and it reads, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. <coughs> Would any of you like to pray today? Yeah? No? <laughs> okay, I will pray then. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for giving us dragonflies that we can see here and for reminding us the importance of patience and waiting for your plan for us. We ask that you please with our service today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may go back to your seats now. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that uh, children story. Appreciate it. So when you see a dragonfly, you know they're basically how they grow, how <laughs> they uh, multiply as well. Our scripture for uh, reading for this morning can be found in Revelations chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. If you have your Bible with you, electronic or otherwise, you can open it with me and we will uh, read it together. Revelations 2, chap uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses uh, 4 and 5. I'll be reading for the, from the New King James Version. I think I need to remove this one more clearer. Verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Blessing upon the hearing of the word of God for us this morning. Now we come to the special song by the Banfield SDA Church Choir.
Amen. As I understand it, it's probably the first time in two years since we've heard the church choir. It's a good sign to or good sight to see the choir back again and just singing here. I was just sitting down at the, at the front and I'm just wondering how far is the reach of the conducting because I'm wondering, should I move a little bit back? Because as the, as the song starts to build up, I'm, it's only one this and then I'm, I'm knocked out. But I really, I really appreciate um, the energy and the enthusiasm behind the song. I was thinking forever as in like, there's one thing that's not gonna be forever, which is COVID. And I think during the pandemic, it felt like it's like, it's going on for like a long time, but something to look forward to when we get to heaven is that we will be in a place where we won't be having to deal with any of the sickness or, or any of the problems that we're going through for a very, very long time. Um, what was I gonna mention? So, this morning, I'm actually going to be sharing from a bit of a Bible study from um, yesterday. So I think from like last week until now, we're um, starting these um, Bible studies with the youth, and we're going through the book of Revelation. And speaking of um, youth, we also, I, forgot, I don't think we announced this a while ago, but the youth will be having a sundown today at 5.30. So for the youth, we have that um, later this afternoon. So yeah, and going back to the Bible study, there was this one church that we were talking about, and for me, it kind of, I sort of connected with it in a way where it's not just a church that was just only for that period of time, but it's also very applicable even to now. So before we get into that, let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you again for um, this time that we can come before your Throne of grace with thanksgiving in our hearts. May we um, um, see you as you are and just um, behold your glory this morning. Um, leave me as I speak, um, and that as I speak, that you will be the one to reveal yourself to each and every one of us, including me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Revelation 2, we'll be spending much of our time there this morning. Revelation 2, I'll be reading verses 1 to 3. We'll go to verse 4 later on and onwards. Revelation 2, verses 1 to 3, and it reads, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, Jesus write, Ephesus write, These things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. 
I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst, canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which they say are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and he has patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. So the church that we'll be talking about this morning is the church of Ephesus, which is the first church of the seven churches that is mentioned in Revelation. So just a little bit of a background as to what Ephesus was like. It is located around a coastal sea, around the Sea of Aegean in Asia Minor, which is pretty much um, modern day Turkey. And when I was sort of reading um, what Ephesus is, is like, just like describing all the, um, all the stuff that it has there, landmarks, and just the amount of attention that it got from people outside of Ephesus. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Vancouver because it's like on the, around the coastal area. There's a lot of things that it kind of offers to everybody, to a lot of people. Commercially, it was very ideal for people, especially for trade ships that would be coming in and out of different um, places, countries, or places overseas. And at the same time, it was also a religious attraction to um, pilgrims for the goddess of Diana or Artemis in Greek mythology. And in fact, one of their temples in one of the temples in Ephesus, the Temple of Diana was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So at the time, it was a very uh, popular place around the time during the Roman Empire. And in fact, if you look at the etymology of the name of Ephesus, it can be translated to desirable. So you can imagine, like from all the things that it has to offer for everybody, it has something that everyone will like. And at the same time, it gives you a perspective into what the church of Ephesus was, was having to deal with at the time. And it got me wondering where do you think the Christians back then, or us today, which, which one do you think would be a lot harder to deal with as a Christian? Back then where um, you're surrounded by a lot of pagan practices, or today where it's kind of like, so more or less the same, but it's a little bit more civil, but at the same time, if you were to give like a track to somebody, they would probably just rip it up in your face, that type of thing. I don't know, but it's all, I guess it's all about perspective. But there are three applications that we can look at when it comes to the seven churches. One is the historical application, as mentioned before. This was also a church that was, that, that existed before in the past, the same with the other six churches, real churches that happened in real time in the past. The universal a application looks at the seven churches as churches, um, What's it called? We can look at the seven churches as sort of like applicable to us as well. So each of these seven churches had pretty much distinct problems or shared similar problems, but they all had very distinct identities and personalities. If we had like six, we, you guys are familiar with like 16 personalities for like people or like for us, and we try to figure out what our personality is, or maybe astrology. That's kind of like what the seven churches is to um, church in a way. Someone asked me what my what my zodiac sign was was or something like that. I think the first time I got here, and I wasn't so sure. I think I looked it up. I think it was because I was born around August. I think it was like a Leo or something like that. But I'll take that with a grain of salt. I don't really think that's. It sounds a little bit like I don't know about that. But that's that's the universal application where we look at the seven churches and try to sort of connect where we're at. A lot of us. I mean, what's it called? The common understanding is. Um, where we are right now as a church is Laodicea, right? So it's basically worship now, apostatize later, that type of thing. And going to the prophetic application as well. So each and every church, one scholar puts it, each of the seven churches remarkably, in his own word, corresponds to different types of um, periods in Christian history. And yeah. So that's why we have like this sort of this connection with, not connection, but like we have the, this um, comparison toward the Laodicean church. But we're gonna be focusing a little bit more of our time on the universal aspect of the church of Ephesus. And the thing is it, it kind of, today we have some type of like qualities and quirks that sort of resembles the church of Ephesus. 
I was once uh, meeting up with this guy from Marketplace because so I was buying um, something from him. And around that time, when I was trying to send my e-transfer in, it took a while for it to process. So while we were waiting, we just ended up talking. And then he asked, and then around that time, I was starting to wonder, like, oh, why is this e-transfer not uh, pushing through? And that thought came to my mind as like, it's almost like something was whispering to me saying, hey, this could be a good time to evangelize to this person, that type of thing. But I was trying to be careful as to like whether or not or when to pull out, um, whether that I'm a Christian or not kind of thing. But around the time, it basic, he basically asked uh, what I do or like, what it, like, what's your lifestyle like, that kind of thing. And the conversation slowly went into, um, church-related things, and the way it went, as we were talking about church, I kind of got the impression that he had, he had like at least some reservations as to um, church in general, basically. And then towards the end of our conversation around the time when my e-transfer like got through, he, he said he was a church goer, but at the same time, he, the stuff he was kind of saying still kind of felt like there was some type of you know, yeah, I know I go to church, but sometimes I feel like it's not really for me, that type of thing. But if you look into the Church of Ephesus, when we look at um, the stuff that Jesus basically commends about this church, he is aware of what the Church of Ephesus is doing and commends them for how they're so strong in their, um, in their beliefs and their doctrines and just giving them like a thumbs up or just like... Um, a shout out basically, basically like saying like, yeah, I know what you guys have been going through and I commend you very much for staying um, in the faith. And what's really interesting too is that they were so bold to the fact that they were even testing those who claimed to be apostles. And as one interesting commentary puts it, and I say commentary and I really like how this puts it, it describes how the Church of Ephesus draws the line between truth and error, rather that, rather that is in doctrine or in life. So it doesn't. So everything that they believed and what they um, stood for wasn't just confined within the church. In their life and their lifestyle, they brought it everywhere they go. So that's why it. Um, what's it called? That's why it describes how. They're so intolerable. They, they can't tolerate um, evilness or basically whatever is that's going on around them. And you can imagine in a place like Ephesus where, especially at the Roman Empire at the time, one of the imperatives for the Roman Empire is that because we're giving you all these types of freedom and all these types of um, things that you can do, in return, you should also give your divine and theological adoration to the emperor of Rome. And that could be really difficult. That, that was really difficult for the, the Christians at the time because one of the common things that, one of the common things that was used to deal with um, criminals or people who went against the law was like death or some other serious means, right? And so you can pretty much say that the Church of Ephesus put their belief on the line I mean, put their lives on the line in terms of what they believed as Christians. And they were basically like testing people who claimed to be apostles. And I can also kind of imagine that because they were so strict and they were so grounded in their doctrine and their theology, they probably had no chill in terms of whether or not this guy was an apostle or not, or someone that was basically um, with the church or for God in that sense. And it does say later in verse um, 6 that they did not like the Nicolaitans. And according to the commentary, uh, essay commentary, no one is ex exactly specifically sure who these people were, but it is speculated that they were prob most likely followers of Nicholas, who was one of the seven deacons from Jerusalem. And it was later mentioned that he later fell into heresy later on. And the background of what their beliefs were was that they pretty much mixed in Christian, Christian and pagan practices. And the understanding to me is kind of just like, in order to basically like appease or basically make sure that they're not doing, making any problems or 
not facing any death penalties while being a Christian, for them, it was okay to sort of do what the other pagans were doing. It's like, yeah, well, we're just trying to do this in order to like, sort of make sure everyone's okay with us. We're not causing any troubles, any type of conflicts or issues here later on. But, but we still go to church. We still go to church. But during the weekdays, we'll probably like do this. We'll probably go to the temple. Like, we won't bow down to Diana or anything. We'll probably just like pretend like I'm just fixing my sandals type of thing. I don't know. But that's what the Nicolaitans were basic, what Nicholas was basically preaching around, mixing in all types of um, um, pagan type of rituals or rituals or practices with Christian behavior as well. And the Ephesians did not like this at all. They saw what they were doing and it was either, you're either this or that, right? So that was something that they were very strong about. And I can only just imagine like how like how hard it must have been for them to just be in that type of situation too, because what's it called? In a place that is like bustling with a lot of um, entertainment, a lot of things that are just basically fun to do at the time. Like there was, I'm pretty sure that they struggled with um, their commitment to Christ along with their social life as well, because as one um, scholar puts it, there was um, the fear of social isolation when it came to their um, to them being as Christians in a very worldly environment. And in verses two, three, like Jesus basically commends them and just like gives them heads up, like everything's gonna be fine, and you're doing good, you're doing good. And despite all the what's it called, despite all the um, the comments and just the encouragement that they received for being this way, there was one particular area that they were falling behind in, and that's found in verse 3 where it says, oh, sorry, in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So what is Jesus talking about here? I remember I was talking um, to this friend of mine, and we were talking about, how some Christians will sometimes, like in the beginning, they'll, they'll have like all this like um, fire, this energy, enthusiasm right after they bat get baptized. I'm pretty sure some of you have like come across individuals like this where like right out of the gate, like they have like this incredible God experience and they just want to tell it to everybody else. They just want to just, all thing, all things, everything that they just want to talk about, whether that is like during like the whole week or wherever they go, they just want to like, just talk about God and just how good he is. And sometime later on, like it kind of just gets a little platonic. Like you start to get, you start to relax. You start to um, get acquainted with quote unquote, church tradition in a sense where everything is basically routine and you're doing everything you can to do quote unquote, the right thing by the book in that sense. And it's not specifically like entirely explicitly clear as to what this might be, but we can, well, what we know is that when you begin your life as a Christian, there is always that enthusiasm that when Jesus first comes into your life, there is, there is like a change in your life and the aspect of what you like see in your life as well, because I've seen come across like testimonies where um, they just share like, even at, at, like after those like, um, post-baptismal type of thing. Like after baptism, they, they like tell their story and they tell like how they came to God and just like the journey of them reaching baptism. And then a few years later on, you sort of, you sometimes compare as to like what they were like during, like during their baptism and what they are right now. Some are okay, like they still keep it going, but there's some people that just go through like the Sort of like it's like they went through like a phase and then now they're just a little bit relaxed as to where they are in their christian walk but what the what jesus is basically trying to say here in a sense is that when we kind of look at also in the historic or the prophetic um sense as well the church um when the early church first started or even back when israel started they had this love for god that was like contagious when they first got um, when they first experienced God, there was this love for God that 
couldn't be just contained within themselves. They just had to share with everybody else. And when you have a love for God, there's also a love for other people as well, because essentially when you just have like this message that has changed your life so much, it's too good to just keep it a secret. You just have to share it with somebody else, right? And for, where am I right now? And how does this usually fade? In the sense where like, how do we also try to prevent ourselves from like losing our touch as Christians in terms of what the gospel is truly about? Like what are some ways of like how it can sometimes like fade or sometimes like, like blur out? I think it's also one of the reasons why some people might be leaving the church because there's this guy I went to school with and on a social media or something like that. I can't remember if he posted or whether it was just like scrolling from like maybe a few days ago. And he basically posts that like, now that he has left the church, he just feels like a lot more free and a lot more wonderful because from his experience, he was surrounded by an environment where the church was basically inspired by a fear. If like, if you don't do this, this is gonna happen to you and all that other type of stuff. And in a sense, it's, not all churches can be this way, but there are churches out there that give that type of impression where as long as you do this, you're fine, or else this is going to happen to you. There's always like a cause and effect, and like consequences are always following in whatever you do. That's most, there are churches that basically center around or have a lot of focus into that type of thinking as well. What's it called? Um, yeah, and I've also, I've also been to, I've been around other people as well where, like, like I remember this one time I was talking to another classmate of mine, and I think it was one of the first times someone spoke, um, like, openly criticized the church, and I was just there trying to listen, and for me, I kind of felt a little bit hurt, because for me, being in an environment where, like, I had, like, my friends that I would always like see every single Saturday and then her saying that to me and just like saying like I always wonder what are we doing as a church I mean where is our focus where where have where did we stray away from in order to get to this place right and the thing is you can be doctrinally sound in everything and you can just be theologically correct but if there's no love in it, then what's the whole point, right? I was talking to another, um, this other person that I usually go to for um, theological or spiritual like confirmation and whatnot, or just to have like a really deep um, theological conversation. And I remember telling him like, oh, you, you know, all you, know, you can basically recite or like basically pull out LNG white quotes from the top of your head or all these things and then you tell me like, yeah man, thanks, but like sometimes knowing all this comes with, in his own words, he's basically said it comes with a curse in a sense where it's like, the way I understood it was that, what's the point of knowing all this if I can't actualize what's being um, told, right? Like you can, know and just like analyze what God's love is like, but if you can't actualize it, that doesn't mean anything, right? Like it says in 1 Corinthians 13, it says like, if you can like talk like an angel or if you can like do all these charitable good works and whatnot, but if there's no love in it, then it's nothing. It's, you're just sound or basically like thunder with no rain, right? And when I read that passage in 1 Corinthians, I always wondered, like, how can you, like, do charitable work without giving love? And I remember this, there this one video where it shows what giving to the homeless looks like. And the video was basically, there were these two people that were basically, they had their phones out and they were filming themselves giving to a homeless person. And it was kind of funny to basically see, to see that, but it really was kind of sobering to think that this is what, this is how like we sometimes share or advertise what we're doing like in our lives. It's kind of like advertising that like you're a good person and whatnot. And almost around 
It's almost like what uh, Matthew 6 says, where when you're fasting, you don't need to advertise it to everybody else. You don't, you don't need to, like, it's like you go to a potluck, and then you say, like, hey, can you eat? Like, no, I'm, I'm fasting. Like, if you're going to go to a place that you know that's going to have potluck and you're fasting, don't go. If, or, like, try to contain yourself and try to be a little bit, like, a little bit, like, reserved about it. You don't have to tell everybody at the potluck, like, hey, guys, don't feed me anything. I'm fasting. Leave me alone. Like, don't do that. It's better to just keep it to yourself because your character, based on what you do, will follow through. Amen? So back to the church of Ephesus and just like how they were just doctrinally sound, but at the same time, they just like lost their touch with how they were as a church, like loving God and then at the same time loving other people. To me, it sounds like when Christians like have um, all the knowledge of the Bible, you can sound like a really condescending Christian because if you sing the song, if you sing that hymn, though, where it's like seeking the lost, it's going to mean something totally different to somebody else. Because, and I realize that too, because especially with um, what Inspire tries to do, I remember when um, like they tried to shift away from like the typical um, Christian jargon. And I really appreciate that too, because sometimes, and this is also something that um, I think it was Doug Batcher who said this as well, where we sometimes don't really recognize who is usually coming through the doors of our church. Because we sometimes don't know if they're like either Adventists or they're just visiting or they're um, like they're just visiting or just like trying to see what the Adventist church is all about. And we sometimes assume that this church, is, that person that's coming here is maybe coming from another Adventist church and we just were quick to say happy Sabbath and just kind of like, kind of, what's it called? assume that they know what we're talking about and I have this thought where there comes a there have to go get to a point where as a church especially when we do Sabbath we have to be ready to worship or just basically preach in the sense that there might be somebody new coming in and sometimes some people will probably complain about like oh our, our, our sermons are starting to get a little bit fluffy oh, God's love come on tell me about the, the beast in Revelation. Tell me about the kingdoms in the prophecies of Daniel. Like, yeah, like those are good and whatnot, but we also have to keep in mind that church is for everybody and that we also have stuff like, like Vespers or even like Bible studies that people barely attend. Like, go to those if you want to go have a deep and like very um, intricate Bible study on like all these certain things. But when it comes to church, everybody is equal at the foot of the cross right so how do we get so how do we avoid being um kind of like the church of ephesus where we're starting to lose that type of love for not just for god but also for everybody else right well if you look at what jesus did during his ministry he was able to reach out to people without compromising his beliefs which is really incredible and that's another thing too is that when we talk about reaching out and going out in the community or like in the city, try to um, minister. It all comes down to where you are with God also because you don't want to conform to what they're doing as well. I mean, Paul says that we have to like kind of like assimilate with them as well, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we have to do what they're doing exactly, right? Well, what Jesus was able to do, he was able to reach them where they were without doing the things that, that, that without doing the things they were doing. Like that one time when Jesus was eating and just like um, basically connecting with Matthew's, Matthew the tax collector's friends. And it's really funny too, like at some of the most wholesome times when Jesus is like connecting with sinners, the priests and Pharisees were just there to like mess everything up. Like Jesus would be just like connecting and just um, showing how loved they are and like how you're still able to come back to Jesus as you are, but able to have a changed life. And the Pharisees would just come out of nowhere and say, like, what are you doing? You're getting, you're contaminating yourself with these sinners and stuff like that. And it's just, at the same time, we also have to keep in mind that, like, whatever we do in our, as Christians, 
it's not always going to impress everybody at the same time. Like, we try to find ways of like, oh, how can we like reach everybody while at the same time trying to please everyone? But we also have to remember that the only person that you have to please is God, and that's all that matters. Because if, we, if we're so keen on trying to please everybody around us, then that's where we start to um, stray away from what the church is like. And we'll end up like being, one of, being like the Nicolaitans who were, make, were basically mixing in Christian practices with worldly things in order to be, you know, in it with other people, right? And just to close is that what are we doing basically in order to keep up with what we're doing or what we're supposed to be as a church? Ignatius from Antioch, um, his writings are not in the Bible, but they're pretty credible and sort of like in terms with Christian history. In response to John's um, uh, letter to the Ephesians regarding, regarding what they should do in order to um, do with what they lost, recognize where they have fallen, repent, and do the first works, Ignatius of Antioch writes that they were able to repent or be able to recognize where they were, repent, and get back to what they were doing at first. The question is, are we willing to do that today? There's this quote that um, Ranko Stefanovic um, wrote in one of his books, in one of the one of our churches, um, um, one of our churches um, leading um, scholars in terms of Revelation studies. He said, "This is if the church does not reflect the love of God, it loses the very reason for its existence." And it's a sobering reminder to us that sometimes we may think that we're doing what is politically correct, but sometimes we could be way off tune of what we're doing as Christians. And it starts from how we are as a church, right? There's the in-reach and then the outreach. Like, we're all equal and like there's, we can't waste any time in trying to like go to each other's throats or create like unnecessary drama because if we're trying to invite people into the church and rant with other people and they see what's going on, then they're probably gonna ask themselves like, what am I doing here? This is a church that's supposed to like exemplify community and it's not showing that, right? So our prayer is that, that we remember what we're supposed to do in terms of what God wants us to do because God is love and we can't keep that to ourselves and we just should just share that to other people. That is my prayer. Thank you, Pastor Neil, for reminding us we need to recognize where we are, repent, and get back. And remember that love starts at home. Game number 652. Let's all stand.
Thank you, Pastor Neil, for a timely message for all of us. And before I forgot, uh, Roger McSallin told me that there is a uh, envelope that has no name. It's uh, for world budget. Please approach Roger to tell you tell your name, because we are going to give a receipt for that. And uh, I would like to thank all the participants, especially the, to the family of Kobas. Thank you very much. And also, I would like to make a special thanks to the choir. We have missed you a lot. Thank you very much. And happy Sabbath to all.